Hello, everybody. Welcome back to In My Feels. My name is Emily Heidel. I am JRE, and we have a special guest. We do. Uh, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Kevin Maher. I'm a choreographer and creative director based out of Los Angeles, born and raised here in California. Hey. And I get, I get to do what I love for a living. Hey. That's amazing. Yeah. That's the best thing in the world, to be honest. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you've been doing it extremely successfully. I'm just going to name a couple of the performers, the acts go. that you've worked with. Um, so starting with Britney Spears, Nicki Minaj, Becky G, J Lo, Justin Bieber, Madonna, and a lot of the people who listen to this podcast love K pop. So um, what's relevant to them is NCT, Max, or Chongmin from TVXQ, uh, Super M, Girls Generation. It seems like you've worked with a lot of like SM artists, right? Yeah, a lot of SM artists. Okay. Hey, that's what's up, though. Yeah. Have you ever gotten a chance to visit SM, like, out in Seoul? Or is it more mm. of just, like, you're sending them the choreo beforehand? Yeah, I just um, send them the choreography. Uh, one time I was asked to go out, or a few times, and it actually was going to work out. And then something mm. happened with the scheduling. It didn't work. Mm. But I've never been lucky enough to, like, go and work in person. Uh, but I have worked with artists that have flown to L.A., Mm, okay. Ah, okay okay yeah i guess on that note what you know in working with a lot of huge western artists and a lot of huge like korean artists um what's what are, are there any stark differences between working with western artists and k-pop artists and you know the choreography aspect um let's see i don't feel like i have to water anything down for k-pop artists i yeah. feel like they like it's part of the discipline to get the dance game on point and to do like the newest and what's next and difficult yeah. things or whatever the case is. But the trend. with, um, yeah, but like with a lot of artists out here, um, you know, you want to make sure they don't look like they're trying too hard, but also oh. make them look cool. But also there's a lot of different factors or maybe they don't really want to dance but they want to be a part of the dance. Mm. And so you have to find your ways to, uh, you know, um, like if you're just wearing a white t-shirt and jeans, you can still wear it like a supermodel. It doesn't have to just be for the beach. So I got to, I got to make sure like the artists out here, they're a little bit more pickier where I know I can trust whatever I'm giving to um, any of the K-pop artists that if there's an adjustment needed, they'll make it. But for the most part, I get to see what I created oh. come to life. Oh, so that's a little bit okay. different. Yeah, um, like it's like how they view dance. And yeah. I think, um, you know, some, some artists here, they don't want to look like dancers or they don't want to look like they're trying too hard. But um, K-pop is infused with dance so much mm -hmm. that dance is like, you know, um, maybe like, a one third of the formula mm. and yeah. so um so it's a, it's a it's something you look forward to um and there's dance artists here like um like a beyonce or a mm -hmm. j-lo and they'll do all the choreography but then there's True. artists like like Nicki minaj she'll step in for a second and step out or uh, bieber yeah. will step in and step out so okay. it, it's it's a different take on um whether the artist loves dance that much that's an interesting aspect like yeah, like now looking back at like different music videos, sometimes they just have like, like say Justin Bieber, they have choreographers or Nicki Minaj, but they don't really participate in the choreography as much as like in guessing K-pop is like, they have to like <laughs> learn it. Yeah, so it's interesting, yeah, wow. So Beyonce, J-Lo, they're dancing artists compared hmm. to, like you said, J Bieber. So you're pretty much choreo or choreographing for the backup dancers for the most part? Yeah, or you're, or you're choreographing to create pictures around them to mm -hmm. tell the narrative of what they're singing because yeah. um, a lot a lot of the singers want to be the narrator and tell the story so you create the the world around that story um but but other times uh, you know um the singer's not the narrator they're the first person so they're in it and 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 then they have a partner and they dance together or you see mm -hmm. when there's a couple dance or whatever the case is so Mm -hmm. um it's just it, it's a different perspective um but like you said like in in, in k-pop culture mm -hmm. dance is ha is is a must yeah <laughs> especially in sm for sure yeah. yeah let's see how important is it to have representation in the dance world it it 
seems more important when you start doing jobs that are really big and like a SAG or union jobs, because mm. then there's rules and there's benefits and there's um, like extra perks. And then there's, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, blurred contracts that maybe you as a dancer wouldn't really know unless you had someone helping you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you don't need representation to get started or to build a reputation or to create a community, but you do need rep representation as you get further along and you're on set and someone hands you a contract and you feel oh. pressure to sign it and, and you want to be able to say, sure. well, can you send that to my agent to look at? Cause mm. I don't know what that means. Mm. And then, and then maybe you find out good thing you didn't sign that. Or oh. um, if you're doing like a movie or something. So as you get further in your career, it's really helpful to have somebody to handle the business. So you don't mm -hmm. have to be awkward. You could just be the fun, the fun party just person. You. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and let them handle the, the fine, fine print. Well, that's mm. facts. Yeah. You know, don't yeah. want to disturb your image like, oh, he was a little awkward or he didn't know what to do. You don't want to look stupid, basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wonder, so a lot of, I don't know if it's the same in the dance world, but I know like in, in reporting and hosting and things like that, um, a lot of people think that when you get an agent, like that's that, like you, you're going to, you're set and like, they're going to help you with everything. And especially at the beginning, that's certainly not the case. Um, I wonder if that's do people kind of think the same thing or have you, did you think the same thing when you were starting out? Like, Oh, mm. if I get an agent, like then I'll get these big jobs. Yeah. Like, you know, when you first start, you think like, Oh, I'm going to get an agent and then I'm going to book all these things. Yeah. And I'm going to have this and that. And then as you are further along in the career, you realize somewhere the agents are actually working for me. Oh. So I need to make sure that they're communicating the way that I see appropriate. Like, I don't want my agent telling the job that I'm being difficult. I want to, and so you start to learn along the way, like, wait, they're actually working for you. And then you learn, maybe I should switch agencies because this one is, mm, I don't know, a different vibe, or maybe yeah. I should go here. But yeah, at first, when you start, you think that's all you need to, to, to get your foot in. And it's definitely a stepping stone. But when you soon learn like agencies have hundreds of people in there and you know 40 of them look like you and offer the same thing and so <laughs> they, then you start to go oh they really don't have anything to do you have to do all the work yourself even with an agent and then they kind of help navigate your your uh timeline or your paperwork or whatever the case is but they're not actually getting you the jobs you are mm, i see yeah that's true yeah that's so interesting like they're and especially with the ones that have like 40 different people on their roster they're like if there's one job that comes up then all four you're being like uh sent in for or like being uh submitted for it and mm -hmm. it's like well yeah how are you helping me like you know i guess it's like well one of y'all are gonna, it's gonna be picked i guess <laughs> you started dancing professionally at 19 years old correct yeah mm -hmm. okay what was your goal at 19 and has it changed and if so what is your goal now I mean, um, honestly, when I first started at 19, like one of the first jobs I got was teaching like seven year olds. Mm. And I, I was terrified of all these little kids in the room, <laughs> but I kept getting great responses from the parents and the, the, uh, the okay. dance studio. And so I was like, um, terrified to go into this room of seven year olds every week, <laughs> but I kept, kept going back because I thought like, as long as I'm making a living off of dance, I'm doing more than like a lot of my family's done, which is jobs they're not passionate about. Mm. So, so I kind of always remind myself along the way, like it doesn't matter if you're teaching seven year olds or if you're touring the world with an yeah. artist or if you're doing a big movie or something, as long as you're making a living off what you love, you're good. And I think that's, that's kind of kept me uh, grounded and, and grateful. And then, and then that way, like I'm, I'm consistent. And then any job that comes along, that's just a bonus but then finding that like mm -hmm. consistent. So my personal goals haven't changed because I'm just loving what I do and I'm happy. Hey. But like, of course, you know, having a, um, like a, a different type of artist to work with or mm -hmm. a different, like doing the Olympics or something, that's a goal. That'll that be changed. dope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, the, you know, different ways to look at it, but the, 
but the story of teaching seven-year-olds that I once hated became like my <laughs> ground level of, of gratitude. Hmm. Hey, I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking about like artists, what is one artist that you would like to like work with? Living or dead, actually? <laughs> oh, that's, that changes it. That changes <laughs> it. Uh, it does change it. <laughs> I, I I mean, since you changed the, the the question a little bit, I think I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Prince. I would oh. love to have like done okay. done something dramatic and crazy yeah. and funk, funky, and he has all the worlds in it his music mind. combined. Yeah, you, you can't do any wrong there. Like you can infuse like break dancing and mm -hmm. theatrics, and you could do miming. <laughs> you could do. Yeah. Uh, you know, it work. Um, in, anything. Yeah, and it would work. So I, I would love to have done something there. Ooh, Prince, mm. that's a good one. Yeah. How often, like, for example, I'm thinking of, like, Prince, somebody who would come in and be, like, almost collaborating with you, like, oh, like, this is what I'm thinking. And um, how often, or what do you prefer between, like, an artist that's wanting to help, almost like, let's work on the choreography together, compared to an artist that's like, teach me, just teach me. Mm. I think we're like as a choreographer, you're always prepared to adjust. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like a tailor or a designer, you just bring in like mm -hmm. a, a kind of a look, and then you gotta fit it on the person to get it yeah. making look right. Mm -hmm. So we're always prepared to adjust. Um, I prefer someone telling me what they like because then I get to see where their perspective comes from. Yeah. Um, and then, but but sometimes people, um, because they're artists, they don't really know how to communicate well. So instead mm -hmm. of saying like, oh, uh, I'll give that a try, but what if they, they'll say like, uh, that's whack, I don't like it. Or they'll say, that's <laughs> weird. And then, and then <laughs> I'm stuck like, okay, what does that mean? How do I fix this? Yeah, it's like a puzzle. So there's different types of artists, like some artists that are, that they trust you and they're like, just, you know, show me whatever you have and I'll learn it and then we can adjust. And mm -hmm. then there's some that don't know you and then they're, they, they want to see you do it or they want to ask you questions why are you doing that where did that come from and mm -hmm. you know it's all fine we're all prepared for that as as choreographers um but yeah it can be funny if someone says i, I don't want to do that and then you're like okay okay well what are you thinking <laughs> and, and they're like i don't know but not that so it, it, that can be oh. a little weird yeah that's it's a little bit hard speaking about like with all the artists you've worked with what uh I'm curious to what like music did you listen to growing up that maybe inspired you to go into dance? I kind of went through like little phases. I remember growing up and my brother was into Michael, but my sister was into Madonna mm. and my, my mom would listen to some um, Latin music and my yeah. dad would listen to Irish music. And okay. I remember like hearing all these things like, well, I don't know what I like for myself. And then, um, I started to connect like um, with like uh, De La Soul and Tribe Called Quest. Mm. And then that infused to like alternative because I, I grew Tribe up in Called California. So, so I would listen to like Smashing Pumpkins and like more um, alternative things growing up that way. And, and, mm. and then it started to fuse together like at 19 uh, when I moved to New York, all the, the world kind of collected like the skaters and the b-boys and uh the the hip-hop heads and the and mm. it all it was in new york at the same time so it, it all clicked for me um so yeah growing up was like me collecting why everyone loves what they love mm. and then like around high school it all started to kind of uh gel together and so i, I would just go through phases i still do where i want to be like uh electronic music with no vocals or i want to listen to some really hood ratchet stuff or i want to <laughs> listen real, to yeah like you just go through pockets of whatever you're feeling and then you have your playlist for whatever you're feeling mm. <laughs> ratchet versus uh, edm i love it love that so wait you you mentioned like living in new york and uh i know you've been born and ra you were born and raised in like the middle of la in hollywood um what, so I, I know a lot of people kind of who move to LA kind of will be like, oh, LA is this amazing place. And then something turns them off a little bit. You know, have you heard about like how like a lot of New York people are like, mm, New York is better. Um, but what's been able to keep you like, I mean, obviously it's your home, but like what's been able to keep you in um, LA, you know, uh, all of these years? 
It's um, well, when I was like 19 to 23, I was one of those people who lived in New York who thought mm -hmm. New York was better. Oh, um, yeah. But the, that's interesting. But then, yeah. as it circles around, like the problem with LA is everything's like spread out and flat, and mm -hmm. you have to drive there. Um, so if you like your space and your privacy, then <laughs> LA is for you. Um, but if you want to open your door and there's energy right there, then New York is for you. But mm -hmm. um, New York started to feel like um, a little claustrophobic for me. Like the energy is irreplaceable, but the space that you pay for to live there is so yeah. small. And so eventually I was like, oh, I, I just, I'm, I think I'm, a, I, I'm good on New York. I always want to visit there because that energy mm. is one of a kind. Mm. But being out in LA, um, we can drive to the beach and do a run and, you know, be back at home before noon and then have a full day and then, uh, you know, have space. Like I can go in my backyard and like meditate or sit mm. there or do yoga or go for sure. a night swim. And so if you know what you're doing in LA, you have access to everything. But a lot of my friends will come from the East Coast and they don't know where to go. They don't, they can't just walk down the block and find something yeah. fly. True. You have, yeah. you have to drive. Yeah. So it, it takes a while. LA is not for everyone because it's definitely a slower pace. I mean, it's not as slow as like Hawaii, but it's not slow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Real talk. Yeah. I, well, I came from like, I'm from Miami, Florida, so I'm another city boy from the South, but I went to New York for a good amount of time very busy life like you said claustrophobic just want to work to LA I remember going to LA for a, a shoot and I walked to my shoot and they were like they think it was crazy that I walked <laughs> for yeah. 10 minutes and looking back yeah maybe it wasn't the best idea but anyways yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the most common question you've received a common question I you know yeah. I always get like how can I stand out? Like, that's what people mm -hmm. always ask. Yes. And, and, and I always try and tell them like the most like boring basic version <laughs> of you is the most interesting thing we could get. And oh. everyone, it gets so lost because they're like, should I dye my hair? Should I get yeah. tattoos on my face? Should I wear mm. shiny clothes? And it, LA sends the wrong message. Um, it, of like how to stand out and you yeah, got to yeah. stand out and everybody's trying to make it but um it's really not about that it's it's like um giving people who you are right away is a rarity because mm. usually yeah. everyone gives you their their preferred version so like you know if you you or we might think we're boring or you know yeah. predictable or same same version of us we get <laughs> tired of presenting that but that's actually so authentic and so cool so i'm sure. i try and help people to not get the message so blurred that they go so far away from their core self because their core self is what you're going to get after 36 hours of rehearsal and you know eight weeks of being on set together and True. if you're touring the world for three years you know so so it's important to kind of uh, present that version of you that's probably what you think is boring and that is so special um, so that happens a lot. That question happens all the time, especially with like young aspiring mm -hmm. dancers and they don't think that they're uh, unique enough. And mm. so I just get sad when I hear that question because mm. everyone is so fly if they can break it, break it out at any given uh, notice, you know? Yeah, mm. It's very true. Yeah. But it's always like when you get the answer, just be you. It's like, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the answer. Yeah, that is the truest answer. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, you you can easily get caught up in like, you know, do I need to dye my hair or like L.A., you know, can make you think that you need to do one thing that might not be true to you. And um, you I guess it was a podcast you were recently or no, back, it was like back in March of uh, the Hollywood Dance podcast, I believe. Or they were asking you something similar about how. How do you not get wrapped up in like the glitz and glam and maybe the kind of ridiculous stuff that might you know mm. the dance world or LA might give you uh, present to you? Um, so you said you meditate. Is that one of the ways that like keeps you, I guess, grounded? Maybe. Yeah. Well, before this craziness happened, I would I would go to uh, this HPF, this hot power fusion class, uh, oh. this yoga class where it's like 110, yeah. and I would go like wow. sometimes twice a day. It made me feel like I was doing a dance warm up, like I was going to church, like I was working out. It gave me all the things that I needed. Um, and then I come out of there and feel so 
good to tackle other people's stress because mm-hmm. that's half of the battle is like stressful communication. Mm-hmm. So um, going to yoga is my favorite thing um, and swimming is one of my favorite things. I just got some underwater headphones recently. So I'll what? just, uh, yeah, swim with music. And, um, but I think like finding other things that are opposite of what you're pursuing as your passion slash profession is important because the blurred lines of uh, professional and passion are, are really hard to see sometimes. Mm. That's why we get like rejected and we're so sad and you know we, we have to keep trying. So if you can find something else, maybe it's like cycling or maybe it's uh, something for the greater good, not drinking or, you know, tanning, <laughs> like something like that's good for you, like meditating, yoga, roller skating, uh, Ooh, you know, throwing, throwing axes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I haven't tried that. I need to try that. Active and a community. If you can find another community besides the one that you're already driven with, it'll be refreshing. It'll, yeah. it'll be really, yeah, super refreshing. A lot of people, again, like I keep going back to this LA thing, a lot of people's passion is also what their job is. And yeah, that makes sense. Like, you know, finding something outside of it, but it makes sense to, it, it keeps your mind off of it. You have something else to fall back on if something doesn't, isn't going right. Since this podcast is called In My Feels, we like to get a little bit in our feelings. Uh, <laughs> so I've asked this uh, a couple of times, but when was the last time you cried watching a movie or listened to a song? It, it was yesterday and i finished the new netflix show called away and i cried i think every episode but the last one like i was excited and i was sad tears and happy tears and my imagination was moving and um i it was just i i I remember screaming being like i can't take it it was too (laughs) too much um but yeah that that show was the best thing i've seen in a while netflix away it's like a space drama but it's Mm. just so amazing i'm gonna have to check that out that was yesterday whoa yesterday i did not expect yesterday (laughs) i'm not gonna lie yeah most people were like oh about a month ago or like not the day before (laughs) That's yeah, good. One person said, like, uh, I don't think I've ever cried. I'm like, that's that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> liar. Liars, liars. Okay, yesterday. Okay. Has there been a song that got you emotional? Uh, Yeah, mu- music does that to me all the time. I'm trying mm-hmm. to think of, like, what snaps me. I'm, I mean, like, um, I'm trying to think what the last song was. I have, like, different playlists. Um mm. One, one's called uh, Sunset, and it's mm-hmm. like really somber music that I could, I imagine like uh, it's like happening at anywhere on where the sun's setting, so you feel like all the, the beauty and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So sometimes like, not necessarily sad songs, but songs that have so much magic and beauty in them, and then at the right moment infused with the right environment, maybe also um, a glass of wine, and you just feel like so grateful to be alive. And that's mm-hmm. what happens to me more than sad songs making me feel sad things it's more about beauty and beautiful songs at the right time with friends or you know even if it's like a katronata track but you're hearing it with friends and you're like Hmm. we're still getting through this pandemic and we're having a a glass of wine and i'm just so grateful like that that happens (laughs) a lot yeah true 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 love that vibe yeah um i always love this question because people have like dre always asks and it gives people have different um i guess experiences um, especially with songs in terms of uh just life in general um which i guess we've been asking about what if you have if you could have one do-over slash mulligan what would it be um i i i struggle with this one but um one specific incident i don't want to change anything that's like happened that mm. got me to where i've been sure. but there was one time like a couple of years ago on a job where I lost my cool and I've, I've never lost my cool before. Oh. And the guy was saying like, uh, this number looks like shit and this and that. And I remember being like, you're an asshole and you're rude and you shouldn't be. And Just then, and off. then I immediately, yeah. But like till this day, I'm like, Oh, why did I do mm. that? Like, I, I, I wish I, it would have been cooler if I said, Oh, yep. That's what I was going for. What? Thank you so mm. much, you know, and like I and I, instead I, I was just so tired and I remember like losing my cool and I've never done where I like kind of go at it with somebody, mm. which I, I guess that happens a lot, but not with me. I'm pretty patient and calm and, and, and demeanored. And uh, I remember losing my cool and I always think back like, 
okay, I'm never going to let that happen to me again because mm. that was not professional and not my best look and um, it was unnecessary. So that's one thing I wish I could do over was take back that that moment mm. and then walk out walk out of there cooler instead of True. Cha- chaotic. Mm. Yeah. What led you to that moment? Do you remember what maybe there were, if there was a Maybe just being tired. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember because this guy was pretty cranky and pretty uh, mm. rude, but he was one of the owners of the business. And I remember him going around bashing the lighting people and bashing the creative mm. people and bashing the uh, all the people. And, and like he didn't realize that he was the poison because yeah. he's going around doing that. And then I was like, there's no way he's going to come to me. But then when he came <laughs> to me, and, and this is like, this is like, a month of work in yeah. and we're working for 18 hour days and we're all, and I, I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm not going to crack. There's no way. And then something happened and I lost my cool. And I, uh, yeah, I just I remember mean, it like exhaustion and um, seeing that person beat up the other areas yeah, that were, just that up. were working hard. Yeah. It, it didn't sit, sit right with me. I mean, we're all human. I mean, Definitely. And sometimes we're going to just explode for sure. I mean, I've been there, but obviously you would rather be taking like the cool route. Like, okay. Yeah. I'm sure <laughs> the other people who were around you, like the lighting and everybody was like, thank God. They probably felt the same something. way. <laughs> yeah. To be honest. <laughs> yeah. I would have been that person. Like, oh, thank God. Someone spoke yeah, up. Because <laughs> they're probably all feeling the same way. So maybe if you think of it like that, maybe. Yeah. yeah. That's a nice way to look at it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the most true advice you've heard to be true that could even apply to your younger self when you started dance? Well, one of the, the I don't know if this is the, the exact way to answer it, but when I first started dancing, one of the agents that I was working with, uh-huh. he was telling me to always remember that dance isn't a career. It's a transition. And I remember being so mad at him for saying that, like, this is my career. Like I, at that point I was like maybe 24 mm-hmm. and I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. And then later on you start to think, oh, uh, wh- where am I going to go from there? Am I going to teach? Am I going to choreograph? Am I going to act? Mm-hmm. Am I going to direct? Am I going to move into behind the scenes? And I now understand what he meant. And I think it's really important for any uh, aspiring dancers to remember that it's not a career it's a it's a transition so Mm -hmm. you always want to think about that as you're maneuvering through like um keeping your eyes open keeping your options open and keeping your skill set broad so that way maybe you're on a job and they ask you to do a a, say a line or something and you're not shy about it or maybe you know what somebody likes your energy and they want to hire you as a an assistant or something so yeah um I remember when I first heard that I was mad and then I appreciated it and now I'm sharing it back. <laughs> no, that's that's really good advice actually thinking about it. Maybe if I was younger too, I'd be like, what? No. <laughs> but but yeah, keep your like options open too, while even as a choreographer. Yeah. Even so dance what you're saying is basically like dancers, you're you're not gonna always be dancing, if that makes sense. Well, well, yeah, like you can always be dancing, but you're going to change too. And uh-huh. you're, you're, you're probably going to want to grow and you're going to be presented with a lot of opportunities. Oh, and yeah. so if you, if you look at like, you know, in any career, if you say, this is it, this is what I'm doing forever, it could get a little <laughs> stagnant. Um, even like really successful actors, they start their, uh, you know, nonprofit companies mm-hmm. and they, they start to go and help people or they start to teach people back. So you start to think, well, yes, this is my career, but I'm going to transition that into so many different things. And and at first I took it like, what are you trying to say? I'm not going to dance forever. You're trying to say yeah. I can't I can't do what I love. Like, how dare you? But then I understood it later. Like, oh, we we have to you know, not, not think that we can decide what our forever future is and mm-hmm. kind of always be open to all these different endless possibilities while we're moving forward passionately. And so that kind of kept my eyes open the whole time. I mean, I'm still here dancing. I do mm-hmm. maybe more choreography than dance, but um, it's still the same career. So mm-hmm. in, 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 if I look at it the way I, I first thought, then he's wrong. But if I now understand it um, the way I do now, mm-hmm. it makes sense. Like, oh, there's so many worlds connected through mm-hmm. dance and artists and entertainment and music and activism and 
architecture and all these different things. And I, I need to be able to keep my lane going, but uh, do all these different pathways at the same time. Mm, For sure. Interesting. Huh. Dre, if you, if someone told you that when you were like in 2015, would you have been like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know. I was a lot younger. <laughs> I mean, and I'm like a little bit different. I just do YouTube. Obviously, YouTube's a little bit different. Uh, if they said uh, it's not a career, well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to react. Yeah. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but at my at right now, I'd be like, yeah, that makes total sense. Now that I, I've done it for a good amount of time, mm. <laughs> like you, gotta be yeah. in other places too, like this podcast, like for instance. That's yeah, yeah. And you have other goals. You have like you like directing and producing and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. This is great. It was smooth. Yes, yeah, so it, was it went smooth. I had fun. Thank you so much. Hey. Good. No, this was dope. Thank you. And that is it for in my fields. I am JRE. I'm Emily. And I'm Kevin Maher. Yay. Thank you for listening. Thank you for, and thank listening. You for watching. Oh.